Okay, welcome everybody to episode 64 of my live stream. Thank you everybody for coming. We've got a good one here today. Of course, I'm going to answer all of your questions, so you can start putting those in the comment section down below. And of course, because there's very few places you can go to actually get your questions answered, uh, most people, I mean, you can try to DM them, you can try to get them answered, but very few people in the investment world will. So of course, don't pay me, don't super chat me, I don't want your money, but the payment for the live stream is definitely give the video a like. So if you are here, I know that little like button is staring at you, doesn't seem like a big deal, but it is the best way to get the videos pushed out. So if you would do me a favor, go ahead and hit that like button and uh, maybe I'll get a few more people watching these live streams. So I think we got a good one today. I think it's going to apply to a larger group of people. Typically, we do spend a lot of our time talking about volatility products and options trading. But today we're going to branch out a little bit further and we're actually going to be talking about leveraged ETFs, which is something that even if you're not a volatility trader, it is probably a topic that will be interesting to you. So um, here's the rundown here. Of course, that's going to be the first thing we talk about. And then second, if you've been following my live streams over the last few weeks, you know that we are currently in a VXX trade in my wheel of fun strategy, and we're going to go ahead and continue that. So I haven't actually looked at the price of the VXX in, uh, in about an hour, and I'm not going to look at it. I'm going to try to avoid looking at it. And then we're going to go ahead and continue that trade based on where that VXX is sitting. So, um, of course, I'll recap the strategy a little bit and get you up to speed if you miss them. And then, of course, the live Q&A. Of course, you can ask me anything you want. You can ask me, oh, that's not the right one. You can ask me about my interests. Or Wow, massive fail early on. Um, I haven't hooked that up yet, sorry. Um, you can ask me anything on topic, off topic. Um, you know, obviously people ask about volatility stuff all the time, but you know, if you just wanna hang out and chat with us, that's fine too. I'll answer any questions you have. And if you wanna try to get me canceled by asking some, you know, awkward questions, I'll go ahead and answer those as well. So let's get started talking about leveraged ETFs. Triple leverage only works if you model the strategy as continual additions. If you park your money in a strat at the beginning, you can't reliably offset the friction of three times unless it trends up. Yeah, if it trends up, then of course you can. But if you plot, say, QQQ versus the TQQQ, one times versus three times, what you will notice is that, of course, the triple leverage does well in good periods, but then that market crash brings it almost back to the same spot as the underlying one times leverage Qs. And then it'll accelerate and there's the gap builds and then the next market crash it narrows and it almost touches and over and over again the three times leverage only works under the condition that a the market is continually going upwards in that case it would work b that the drawdowns aren't very violent and the gearing effect of three times leverage doesn't actually crush you because remember beta slippage works both ways it actually doesn't always help you sometimes it seriously hurts you and then the third thing would be if you had some type of timing system where every time the market crashes hopefully you're going to be out fast enough that you don't suffer the full loss. So that's what we do at VTS. That's why I can say, yes, we do use two times leverage. Even though the Qs and the QLD on a long-term buy and hold are pretty much the same when you factor in all the market crashes, I have a timing system where if volatility gets over about 60%, so volatility barometer, if it gets over, say, about here, this level here, my systems will start kicking me out into safety. We'll be getting into cash. If it gets really bad, we'll go long vol, utilities, cash. This is how I'm beating that long-term equation that keeps knocking them back towards each other. It's this constant game where you think you're doing great, crashes right back down, right back to the queues. Think you're doing awesome for three years, pandemic happens, it's right back to the queues again. I'm counting on the fact that while we do suffer drawdowns, they won't be as severe as buy and hold, which means that mine goes up, it goes halfway down to the queues, and then I go to utilities or cash. And then I can ride the up, it goes halfway down, down, and that's how I can make forward progress with leverage. But if you don't have a successful, proven track record of a timing system, leverage doesn't improve performance. It just doesn't. It gives the illusion of performance in a bull market, and then you find out very quickly that, oh, wow, I didn't have an edge at all. It met right back to where I started from, right? The old dreaded give back. All right, so uh, that was uh, just a short clip from a few weeks ago answering some questions about leverage. They come up every single live stream, and of course, I 
put that up. I gave that answer and I just had a million follow-up questions. So I thought I would go a little bit deeper and I'm really going to illustrate exactly why leveraged ETFs are probably for most people out there, very dangerous. You should probably just avoid them. Like I said in that little clip, there is the condition that if you are exceptionally good at managing risk, that they could perhaps provide some value to your portfolio. But uh, I'm going to explain exactly what's going on with these leveraged products that sometimes people don't fully understand. So the first thing that we're going to look at here is I want people to understand that leveraged products doesn't actually just mean that it's two times or three times the actual performance. That's not what these things are. It's a daily rebalanced fund. So it's not like it's just a two times product is double the, the annual return. And if you have a strategy that makes say 10% a year and you plug in a leveraged ETF, well, there you go. Now you're going to make 20. It doesn't actually work that way because it's daily rebalanced, which means that in a bull market, that daily rebalancing is going to help the leveraged funds where of course you're going to be deploying the full amount of capital during a good period and it's going to go up really fast but during a bad period of course it's daily rebalanced as well so you are on the hook for the full brunt of that downturn as well and that's going to really hurt the leverage products in a drawdown and what do we know about most etfs most investors most strategies out there it's the drawdowns are significantly worse than the actual rate of return. So in the end, you're actually looking at something that's going to provide less bang for your buck and add more risk than is necessary. So here's a quick example of the QQQ, the NASDAQ, and we're gonna be talking about the NASDAQ pretty much throughout the day here. And it's return, as you can see, 17.76. This is buy and hold since January, 2012. Now. The only significance there is that I also launched VTS in January 2012. So a lot of my numbers get dragged back to that date. But this is what we're looking at in a drawdown of 35%. That is the blue there. You can see it. Well, the two times NASDAQ, the QLD, the annualized return, you look at these numbers, you think, well, 17.7, shouldn't it be around 36, 35 and a half? Well, no, it's 30. And the drawdown is significantly higher. Now, this also isn't double. But later on, I'm going to show you the math of why this is way worse than double this of the drawdown, All right, Just mathematically. And then, of course, the triple Qs, well, it's not 55% return, three times the Qs. It's only 38 with a massive drawdown. So that's what's actually happening with these leveraged products. Remember, it's daily rebalancing. So why this is important is because mathematically, drawdowns always hurt you more than the gains are beneficial. Right? This is something that I always say, losses are more costly to a fund than gains are beneficial. So if you have a 10% drawdown, mathematically, you will now need an 11% subsequent rate of return to get back to break even. This is just how it works. If you have a 30% drawdown, well, now it's more severe and it requires 43% to get back to break even, right? And it goes worse and worse. 50%, now you need to double your money, 100% return just to get back to break even. And then again, the TQQQQ, well, how many Qs did I say? Four, whatever it is. 80% um, drawdown, 400% subsequent rate of return just to get back to break even. Now, I'm not going to go into this in a whole lot of detail here. Math is pretty boring stuff for most people. But if you want a simple formula for how to calculate this and illustrate why it's so much more severe, the Qs had a drawdown of about 38%, right? So you can just plug it into a very simple calculator and you can figure out the subsequent rate of return that you would need to recover a 38% drawdown. It's about 60.75, right? The triple Qs here, 82.44% drawdown. So now it doesn't need 180, which is triple this. It needs 469% rate of return to get back to break even. This is why those leveraged products always end up back at the same place. It's because, sure, they do great during good times, but just the sheer math involved and the gearing effect of these leveraged products, you can be sure that these drawdowns are going to be much more punishing. We actually have an example from this past, say, two years. So this is the, the QQQ. No leverage. This is just the underlying NASDAQ index. You can see maximum drawdown, and this is, of course, as of yesterday. I've updated all these numbers. So as of maximum drawdown in 2022, 38%. There's that number. It obviously would be very uncomfortable to suffer that, but that's what it did. 
Current drawdown, it's actually getting reasonably close to breaking even, 7.85%. It's not a whole lot more before we can say that the NASDAQ has recovered from that drawdown. But again, because of the gearing effect and the negative impacts of drawdowns, it actually has to have an 8.5% return to get back to break even. Starting today going forward, it needs 8.5%. Well, what if we look at the QLD? QLD, same thing, same time frame. How come my internet is extremely slow here? There it is, kicking in there real slow. Uh, again, updated yesterday, the maximum drawdown here was 65%. So that sounds like a less than double drawdown to most people. They think, oh, 35 compared to 65, that's a little better. It's actually not. The drawdown right now, it's still 30% down. Remember, the Qs are only less than 8% away from all-time highs. The QLD is still 30% away. And starting today going forward, still 42% away from breaking even. This might take a while. The Qs might recover, but the QLD, it's going to be a while. What about the three times leverage TQQQ? That's hard to say, actually. Um, maximum drawdown, 82.44, currently down 53%. This is probably surprising to people to see it visually, right? This is one thing that I often notice from investors out there is sometimes they think that they know something, they've heard some data somewhere and they sort of half process it. They think, oh yeah, well, drawdowns get worse naturally, of course, two times, three times. Yeah, I get it, no problem. But they've never actually seen it. They've never actually illustrated it and they've certainly never actually traded with it. So a lot of times they get blindsided by thinking that they knew the information, but to see it visually so starkly here is, wow, that actually is a significant difference because the TQQQ still has to make a 113% return from today going forward just to get back to break even. So the person who's doing the regular cues, sure, their long-term return might have been a little lower because the good periods weren't as bad or weren't as good. The bad periods are nowhere near as punishing. That's actually what's happening with these products. So the one thing that I said I'm not trying to dissuade anybody and say that you definitely can't use these things. Maybe you can, but the one thing that you need, remember from the clip in the video, you need a timing system that gets you out of those drawdowns. You can't avoid them all. I mean, when you're talking about leveraged products, you have to expect some drawdown, right? The TQQQ on its own had a single day of down 35%. Like these things can really, really move. It can go up 25 or 30, I think 2750 or something was the biggest up day, 35% in one day. So you're talking about things that can really move. But what you need to be able to do is you have to find a way to avoid the drawdowns. So for me personally, in our tactical or defensive rotation strategy, we actually do use the two times leverage NASDAQ. Now, that might sound contrary. Didn't I just say that the risk is too bad? Well, no, not really, because I'm being tactical. We are not buy and hold investors. So what we're doing here is we're essentially using my volatility metrics, and we are rotating in and out of safety and aggressive QLD based on market conditions. And this is how I'm actually producing a better rate of return with the much more risky QLD. It's because I'm only in it about 60% of the time. And when volatility gets to about 60% or higher, I'm going to duck out into the XLU, which is a utilities ETF. And if it gets really bad, of course, we're going to go to cash. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's a pretty big drawdown. Well, the reason that that happened, it's not because we didn't cycle out. It's because, you know, unfortunately in 2022, some of our safety positions also got hammered. You can see that you know, we did rotate out into utilities, but it wasn't overly helpful as it happened. Most years in the past, it's we've rotated into safety. The safety positions have performed reasonably well, and we can be completely flat through all these market crashes, right? 2015 didn't lose anything. 2018, both of them, Volpocalypse and Q4. 2020 pandemic didn't lose anything. I've been very good at managing risk, but of course I am subject to what the underlying air quote, safety positions do. If you want to see some real ugliness, this is the 20-year treasury TLT. Now, there are people who are rotating to this into safety in 2022, getting absolutely destroyed. We didn't use the TLT, but we do use things like IYR, which is a real estate ETF, 
obviously some ugly stuff there. And like I said, XLU being our main safety for that strategy, safety and cash, yeah, we kind of got hit a little bit. But you can see our strategy as of yesterday, and the QLD is actually up quite a bit today, so I'd have to recheck it, but we were only 2% away from all-time highs in our defensive rotation strategy that uses the QLD. But the QLD itself, well, it's still 42% away from the all-time high. But because we are tactical, and yeah, we'll suffer maybe half the drawdown, 43 compared to 65 is, is a massive difference, as I can show you in a second. But yeah, we didn't suffer that the full brunt of that drawdown. So now that we've recovered quite a bit in 2023, strategy's up 70%. We're basically at all-time highs again in this strategy. That is only possible if you have a system that can actually rotate out into things that are going to be safer than the full magnitude of this ugliness. If you don't know how to exit to safety, and if you don't know how to reduce these drawdowns, it can be very punishing. Like I said, if you want to see the very quick math on that, now we're comparing my defensive rotation, which had a 43% drawdown. Sounds like it's not a whole lot of fun, and it wasn't. But it requires a 76% return to break even, which we have made this year in 2023. So we're basically back to break even. It's been a big year for that strategy. But the QLD buy and hold, 65 Again, a lot of people look at these numbers. They think they're very close. Wow, 65 and 43, that's actually pretty close. You didn't reduce the drawdown by that much. Well, look at the difference that it makes when you actually look at real-time compounding of money. The QLD needed 187% return to get back to break even. It's not even close to that this year in 2023. That's why this strategy is still down so far. So this part, this next part that I want to present, this is basically answering a lot of the questions from VTS members specifically about why, because I just showed that we use the two times QLD, why wouldn't we just jump in and use the three times Q or the TQQQ, right? Why wouldn't we use three times? Well, you could, but the truth is, even for somebody like me who has demonstrated over 12 years to have very good risk management, it's not a perfect world, right? Okay, so first of all, this is the spreadsheet performance. My live performance is a little better than this. You'll see these drawdowns, mine are a little bit lower. So it just so happens that my live trading has been a little better than my spreadsheet strategies, which is rare, I suppose. It's, you know, not to toot my own horn too much, but that probably means I know what I'm doing and I'm able to manage things correctly. Because you know, 99% of back tests just fail in live trading. But uh, mine have, my live results are typically slightly better than my back tests. But this is just the spreadsheet. Uh, so I can look at all the minimum drawdowns and whatnot. So this is using one times leverage. And there's nothing wrong with this. And in fact, in my daily email, I actually spell it out pretty clearly that for people who have lower risk tolerance, you go right ahead and use the QQQ. There's nothing wrong with getting a slightly lower rate of return in exchange for lower drawdowns. This is completely fine. You can just use the QQQ, still a fantastic strategy. And you can see the three drawdowns here. The reason that I show all three of them is because I designed my own risk-adjusted return metric called the VTS performance score. The reason I did this is because I really don't like the Sharpe ratio, which the financial industry uses. The Sharpe ratio uses a standard deviation of performance that includes up, includes up and down performance, which of course, that's pretty meaningless. If you have a really good stretch of months, that could actually hurt your risk adjusted metrics. So Sharpe ratio is kind of garbage. You could use the also performance index, which is definitely much, much better. It only uses negative, but I designed my own VTS performance score to really get at the heart of the investor experience. It's really those max pain points that we're talking about, the maximum drawdowns. So what I do is I essentially do the average of the three largest drawdowns. So I take my alpha over a risk-free rate and I just divide by that number. Higher the number, the better. Stuff like the S&P 500 stretched over long periods of time, it's like 0.1, right? 0.2. Talking about very, very low numbers because, of course, with the S&P, 57% drawdown in the financial crisis. And over the last 15 years, it's returned maybe, what, 7%? So you're talking about drawdowns like five, six times larger than the return. Anything over one is exceptional because it means your rate of return is going to be better than the drawdowns you experience. That's going to be very easy to follow a strategy. So this is the one times. 
the two times, the reason that I still think this is okay is because, like I said, sure, it can go into a bigger drawdown. And again, my live trading only went to 43, which probably you're thinking 49, 43, kind of same thing. It's really not. That's a significant difference, trust me. But yeah, my live performance was a little better than this. But again, performance score is above one. So yes, the drawdowns are getting worse. You notice this is a little worse though, 110 compared to 1.24. Well, how about if we use the three times? Well, this is probably going to violate what I would say is pretty much every investor's risk tolerance. So it is true that on a terminal basis, you can probably bump your return up. There's no way anybody can sustain a 67% drawdown and just wake up the next day and keep investing. So while you could say that, yeah, on a terminal level, this is great, nobody's going to be able to do it in live trading. And really, that's the key. Whenever you're looking at a performance report, I really encourage people to try to put yourself into the shoes of somebody who actually suffered that drawdown. Don't just look at a piece of paper that it started here and it goes to here and I want that money. If you don't maintain the course and stick with the strategy, then nothing that happens after that is worthwhile. This year, our defensive rotation's up like 70%. Well, if you quit last year, you didn't get any of that. So I have to make sure that the drawdowns, both for myself, because I'm managing my own money here, but also for people following, that it, it can't breach your risk tolerance. Otherwise, well, it's just a moot point. Who cares? I could show you a strategy that's 100% return, but who cares? With a 70% drawdown, you're going to pull the plug. So it doesn't matter. This is the reason why we don't use the triple leverage. Even for me, somebody who does spend a lot of time managing risk, I'm still not good enough to make this a level where it could be sustainable. It, it's really just not possible. So if you want to see our live results, here they are. Like I said, we're pretty much only 1% or 2% away. And I suspect as of today, let's just see, QLD is up 3.5. We very well could right now be um, breaking to new all-time highs. So that's good to see, considering the underlying that we trade, the QLD, it's still over 40% away. So I think I've done my job pretty well. It was very uncomfortable to see this drawdown. Unfortunately, utilities got crushed last year as well. Bonds, real estate for our other strategies got crushed as well. It was just a very odd year. 2022 was a, just an outlier year. But um, of course, my job is to manage an entire portfolio. And triple leverage is just not required. It really isn't. Like I've always talked about this 12% rate of return for the next 30 years. Everybody's going to retire a multimillionaire if you do that. Just save a little bit of money, make 12% 12 a year. And you're going to compound your money and it's going to be fantastic. You don't need to have triple leverage making 40% a year. It's really not necessary. Now, I'm not trying to reduce this to 12. If it happens to be 20, then great. But trust me, 12% a year is plenty to get everybody to the retirement finish line. And, um, you know, it is what it is. So I personally don't actually think that very many people should be dipping a toe into the leveraged ETF world. And it's also another reason why I'm always talking people out of shorting volatility, at least for the first few years of your experience, of using the UVXY, about using undefined risk options like selling calls or straddles. These are just all terrible ideas. Until you have several years of a proven track record of reducing drawdowns and not getting caught you know, unprepared, because you got to remember that short vol strategies like that, they can move just as fast, if not faster than the leveraged NASDAQ. So you're playing in a world that, you know, probably not ready for. If you've got a long track record of avoiding risk, do your thing. I'm not here to talk anybody out of anything. I'm just being the voice of reason here. And drawdowns is the name of the game. If you want to improve your rate of return, you don't chase big numbers. You try to reduce your drawdowns. That's very difficult to do with something that can move 35% in a single day, obviously. So now I just want to go on a little tirade here because something has been stewing inside me. I'm going to pull up the old ARK Innovation ETF, and I'm going to actually just say out loud what a comically bad investor I think Kathy Wood and the ARK Innovation ETF actually is. So here is the ARK Innovation ETF. Back about two, three years ago, people used to ask me constantly, why am I not using this instead of the underlying NASDAQ? Shouldn't we just 
substitute this strategy instead of using the queues, of course we'd be better off using the ARC innovation, right? Just sub out the QLD and have one of the world's greatest investors, Kathy Wood, take over the position for us. And I've always just laughed at this. I even went through a live stream. If you look at this, I've actually done a live stream talking about this ages ago. When was this one? I remember it was a long time ago. Here it is. Episode 11. When was episode 11? Let me pause this. This was made April 24th, 2021. That's almost two and a half years ago. I basically pointed out how awful the ARK Innovation ETF will be going forward. I pointed out that for the first seven years of its existence, it underperformed its benchmark on a buy and hold basis. This is not good at all. To take on that kind of risk, you can see the same pattern happening. During bad periods, it's worse. During good periods, it accelerates. Of course, a blindfolded monkey could have done well in 2017. So she did okay and it recovered and then it crashes back down. This whole thing can be chalked up to one single good year after the pandemic for about you know, eight months after the pandemic, it had a monster return. But I definitely pointed out that in the future, this thing is going to be terrible. And you can see what's happened here. Max drawdown, almost 82%. It's still 237% away from breaking even. It's going to be forever until this thing breaks even. If people thought the QLD was bad, 42% away, I'm sorry, but Kathy Wood is, could be a lifetime away. In fact, I'm going to go on record right now and say there's zero chance it'll ever catch the cues. So a blindfolded monkey throwing darts at the NASDAQ could have done better than this. But um, yeah, that's what it is. Now, the problem with her is that she really only became popular after the run-up. So this is why I'm actually saying she very well could be quantifiably one of the worst investors of all time because that's when the money started rolling into the fund, right? It was only three or four billion before that run up. Now, three or four billion poor people that, I mean, unfortunately they got just destroyed as well, but you can see what's happening. Massive run up all the way to 28 billion in assets under management. And she absolutely lit it on fire, of course. Um, you know, where are we at now? It's back down to 8 billion. So, you know, don't ask me in the comment section why there's still $8 billion. I have no idea why there is more than $1 in that fund. It should be sh scuttled and shut down and laughed at for eternity. But for some reason, there's still $8 billion in capital under management. For some reason, she's still all over the news talking about how her fund's going to make 50% a year going forward and everything's great and it's just innovation and disruption and you have no idea, you'll see. Okay, well, you better make 50% a year going forward, and it'll still be four years before you break even, even if you follow through with that promise. I just think it's absolutely embarrassing. And the worst part about it is that this is fairly rampant across the financial industry. And this is one of the reasons why people hate the financial industry so much, is that for you, the proverbial you out there, the investor, you lost 80% of your money, and surely you pulled the plug. I mean, there's very few people who have the risk tolerance to say, yeah, I, I still trust her. I think it's fine. No, you don't. It drew, drew down that much money and they lose their money. But does she? No, she's still worth $250 million. She probably lives in a mansion with a view that you wouldn't even believe how beautiful it is. Does she have to give back her houses that she bought? No, of course not. She still gets those fees rolling in. She lit $20 billion of investor capital on fire but she still gets to live where she lives. Anybody who followed her with conviction, of course, they're gonna have to downsize their life. You know, we socialize those, you know, socialize her losses by basically just constant streams of not only asset management fees, but just television spots left and right still to this day. Got Jim Cramer ringing his bells, calling her the, you know, the magical investor. It's, it's really terrible. And she's not the only example, but it's a pretty bad one. And you know, two and a half years ago, I called this. I said, look, you can look at the holdings in this portfolio. All she has done is just levered up all the shit beta names that she can find. And yeah, sure, in a good period, it'll go up. But apparently with all her, you know, people working for her that no doubt have PhDs from MIT and, you know, Wharton PhDs, 
Apparently, they didn't understand that drawdowns cost the fund a lot more than the gains actually help it. Again, same problem as before. It probably would have been beneficial if somebody explained this to them a long time ago, that sure, you can buy all the names that are going to run up insane amounts when it's a pure bull market and everybody's thrilled. But what's going to happen when you suffer an 80% drawdown? You're going to be 400% away from breaking even. It's going to take the rest of your life to chip that back. So I don't think it's ever going to happen. I think it's just a disaster. And I just wanted to say that, that look, um, playing with leverage, playing with these big names, the unfortunate reality of the situation, and I see the same thing in the volatility space. The people who gain popularity are the ones that are talking about shorting the UVXY, about selling naked calls. People who think that stuff's great until what happens, it's inevitable, right? It's going to happen. You're going to follow them right off a cliff. You're going to turn around and say, well, hold on a second. You said that everything was safe. You said that I was able to hedge it. When that terrible event finally happens, I'm just going to be able to hedge or I'm going to have money on the sidelines ready to deploy and defend my positions. No, you're not. It's going to totally blow up in your face. And then what's going to happen? Does that person have to give back all their followers afterwards? Does that person have to give back all of the gains that they made in their popularity and selling their courses? No, they don't. They get to keep their beautiful view with their big house. And the people that followed them, of course, reality sets in very hard for those people. So I'm always going to be the person that is against those people in the financial industry that is just comically ignorant when it comes to risk management. And um, Kathy Wood, I'm fairly comfortable saying is one of the world's worst investors, but um, still managing $8 billion. And here I am, what am I managing? A, a small community of, of people, but... Um, I know a whole lot more than Kathy Wood does about risk management, that's for sure. So uh, there's my rant. Uh, ordinarily, because I'm a really polite Canadian and I don't like to insult people and I don't get into online beef, I don't really have any haters. Ordinarily, I would say, oh, sorry, I was a little bit harsh. But in this case, Kathy, I want to say a lot more, but uh, not like anybody like at that level is ever going to look at my tiny little live stream. But um, it is definitely worth saying that Risk is only fun during the bull market. That is not going to be a whole lot of fun when the wheels come off and the reality sets in. Oh, wow. They didn't have any idea what they were doing. They were just talking about big risk, $7 trillion of capital injected into the market. It makes a lot of people look like pretty good investors. But uh, unfortunately, no, they don't know the first thing about risk management. So there's my little rant. Hopefully people listened to me two and a half years ago during that live stream and uh, didn't jump on the ARC board or ARC train. But uh, let's get into the wheel of fun. So this will be interesting. I have resisted the temptation to actually look at the VXX price, but let's jump in together and let's actually execute today's wheel of fun trade. So we're going to open this up, check out the SPX up 0.75. Oh, VXX, 23.25. So let's recap where we are in this cycle, just for people who are trying to follow along. The previous two weeks is probably worth going back and looking at, but essentially this is a strategy that I do quite a bit on the side. It's just an option strategy that I really enjoy trading. I call it the wheel of fun. That's just an internal name with me. It's not something official or anything. But basically, we started two weeks ago, we sold a cash secured put on the VXX, and we collected some premium up front. I've actually tracked the premiums down here. So our first trade, we collected 36 cents for this step one of the put. And then two things can happen. It can either expire in the money, and you get assigned the shares, or it expires out of the money, which would have been over 23.50, and nothing happens. You just lose your trade. It's over. You go right back to the step one and you go again. As it happened, I basically forced an allocation where at the time of the live stream on Friday afternoon, it was trading at about 2340. So I basically assumed that we were going to get assigned the shares and I continued on to step three. As it happened in the last couple hours of the day, VXX actually did drift upwards and it expired at about 2377, I believe. So technically speaking, I wouldn't have been assigned. 
this strategy works better if you can actually wait for the last five minutes of the day. And if I would have done that, it would have just been another easy money and we would have gone right back here. But I forced the issue and I assumed that it did at one o'clock in the afternoon exercise. So then we sold our covered call for 63 cents. And now two things can happen as of today. One, it can expire above 2350, in which case I will lose my shares. I would go back into cash and surely I would jump right back down and sell a cash secured put on the VXX for next Friday. That's what I would do. But right now it's at 2325. So that means it expires out of the money. Covered call will not be exercised, which means I keep my shares and I would go back and sell another covered call. You can see the wheel of fun going around here. We are right here. We went to there, it didn't exercise, so we're gonna bounce back to here. And again, I'm going to make the assumption here, 2327, if something crazy happens in the last two hours today, and once again, it goes over 2350, technically speaking, that would mean that I lose my shares, but I'll just fake it and make it appear like everything's fine. So we're gonna assume that right now, this is the expiration price, 2327. We're gonna keep our shares, and all we have to do now, very, very simple, seven days from now, so next Friday, make sure you come back and check out this trade, we basically sell a covered call. Now, this is gonna be another situation where during my live streams, I do like to have some additional education and I may not always do the exact textbook trade. And an example of that was this week. So I have the shares at 2350, right? My cost basis is 2250. So we're up money. This trade is going well. We brought in 99 cents. We're doing fine. I would say the textbook way to go about this would be to sell the 2350 covered call because that's what the shares are priced at, the ones that I own, and I can still get 59 cents. So I could go ahead and go in here and I could get my 59 cents. That would bring my cost basis up to my premium collected to $1.58 my cost basis would be all the way down at 2192. That's pretty far away from where the price is now. But you don't always have to sell the covered call or the puts or anything at the money. You don't have to, right? 2350, I don't really have to do that. So in this case, I probably still would. If this was just a standard trade using my own money, don't care about the live stream, I would sell this 2350 covered call and I would check back next week. Very simple strategy. The wheel of fun is not complicated. You just don't want to get yourself into trouble. That's why we use a 10% total value stop loss. I always mark it down here. If this thing does get really far down and I've lost 10% of my capital that I allocated to this specific trade, then I'll just shut the thing down. No harm, no foul. Losing 10% on a single trade, it's not that much. That's a very reasonable stop loss. But what if I sold the 23 covered call? What would that mean? Well, first of all, it means I can probably bring in 77 cents, okay? So that's worth a little more to me, right? Gets my cost basis down to 21.74. But that also means that if the VXX expires over 2023 20, next Friday, I lose my shares at 23, but I own them at 23.50. So I would lose 50 cents on that trade. Now I would actually go to 27 cents there. I would still have a very profitable trade for a three week cycle. That would be still very good rate of return for just three weeks. But I'm just illustrating that because we know the VXX does go down, you are not always locked in to selling at your share price. I don't have to just do that because you can imagine if this thing continues to decay, well, it's not going to be very long before these 2350 covered calls are not actually paying a whole lot of premium. So right now today, I'm going to, for educational purposes, I am going to go ahead and sell the 23 covered call. Oh, I'm going to do it in the actual trade tab. So VXX, here's the one that's expiring today. I'll clean it up at the end of the day. So everything's fine. It'll just be maybe small losses in my own pocket, no big deal. But for the purposes of education, let's go ahead and try to get this at the good price. So I have a thousand shares right now that I was assigned. So I can sell 10 of these for 77. I'm gonna try to chase the mid at 80, but I'm gonna use my 30 second rule, right? No harm in trying to get a little bit better. So I would go one penny over, 
check everything's right, okay? 4th of August, 10 contracts, 81 cents. Now the mid is at 90, so I can go to 80, and I can just go ahead and try to get this. So what's gonna happen, it's gonna go in the queue, and I got it. That's why you use the 30 second rule. Because if I would have done anything below that, right, what would have ended up happening is, I probably would have lost a penny or two. Now, no big deal, but you do always wanna get the best price you can. So because it happened so quickly, you weren't actually able to see it. I would wait and I would watch it in the queue for about 30 seconds, and then I would just adjust it one of the smallest increments that you can adjust. So for that contract, it's one penny, sometimes it'll be five cents, but I would just go to 80, wait 30 seconds, go to 79, wait 30 seconds. Of course, I want the more the better because it's a credit, but uh, yeah, it went through everything perfectly fine. So now where are we at? Well, let's put that in. I got 80 cents, sweet. So we just sold our covered call. So we just sold this cycle again. And now next Friday, five trading days from now, one of two things can happen. It can either expire over 23 and I'm gonna lose the shares at 23. I own them at 23.50, so I'm gonna lose 50 cents there, but I've already brought in $1.79. So I'm actually gonna make $1.29 in that process. Or if it's below 23, nothing happens. I keep my shares. And next Friday, I will go right back in and I will do another covered call, probably aggressively again. I don't mind going down to the 2250, even the 22, as long as my premium that I'm bringing in and I'm constantly collecting here, as long as these premiums are piling up and my cost basis is going lower and lower, then at some point, I'm going to be able to time out the VXX. And at some point, one of these weeks, it's just gonna go up a little bit and I'm gonna be out of the trade. That's what's gonna happen. Now, ideally speaking, of course, what I want, this does look like a long vol trade, right? When you sell something at this price and you want it to go up, I guess that's technically speaking a long vol trade, but why I call it a quasi short vol strategy is because what I actually want is I want the VXX to decline. I just don't want it to violently decline, right? In our tactical volatility strategy, for example, in the, Actually, I should probably, I could probably just show it right here instead. Tactical volatility. What am I looking at? Let's go all the way to the top of this page. This strategy here, we are basically holding the SVXY. And in the past, we were using the XIV. In the past, we were using, you know, 60 Delta VXX put options. Whatever we do, we want it to violently go down. We're trying to capitalize on that. And then we're trying to sidestep the risk management spots to exit to a big, comfortable position of cash in the middle, 40% cash, and then gold if things get, you know, really bad, or VXE if it gets really bad, of course. But when you're talking about the short vol strategy that is the wheel of fun, I call it short vol because I actually want it to go down, you know, 50 cents, a dollar every week. And I can just follow this thing down and just keep building that premium. And eventually the VXX is gonna have a week where it bumps up and I'm gonna lose these shares. So you can imagine what's gonna happen. It's possible that at some point a month from now, I'm selling covered calls at 21, 20. It could even go that low, but do I care? No, if I have the shares at 2350 and I have to eventually sell it for 20, but I brought in $6 a premium, well, I'm way ahead. That's a very profitable trade. So we're already um, off to the races. It's only two weeks in. Um, so that's how this strategy is going to work. And that's why in the live streams, you will see me call this a short ball strategy, even though, of course, mathematically speaking, it's probably not. Um, you know, you finally get out of the trade when the VXX goes up but um, I, I still consider it short vol. Same with our VXX butterflies and our UVXY butterflies. These are short vol trades. I just don't want it to go so violently that it gets me into trouble, right? Because then, I mean, not, it's not trouble, trouble, but you might have to sell the position at a small loss, which sometimes trades lose money, spoiler alert. Um, but I don't think this one will. So far, we're doing pretty well. All right, let's get to some of these questions. See how many there are. Hopefully people enjoyed that... Um, leveraged ETF presentation and um, my little rant on not only Kathy Wood, but just an indictment on the entire financial industry. What an absolute disaster. Is there anywhere, like, look, at we're, we're all just regular people, just working regular jobs. Do any of us have jobs where if we were quantifiably speaking, one of the worst performers on the job that you could imagine, 
not only do we not get fired, but we get elevated to a status that very few hum human beings get to experience. Could you imagine being in an industry where performance means absolutely nothing? It does not matter if you incinerated $20 billion of investor capital, you still get to go on the news and tell everybody that next year I'll make 50%. Unbelievable. It's just embarrassing that I'm even tangentially in the same you know, industry as her. It's embarrassing for me. But uh, rest assured for anybody who follows my work, I'm not in that boat. If sometime in the future you log into my performance that's publicly available for the last 12 years and you see a dip in performance of epic Kathy Wood proportions, believe me, I've moved on to a new career. Um, people have laughed at me. They've, they've shown me the door and I have politely said, yes, I am awful. I'm leaving now. Uh, I won't still be here on, you know, live streams telling you, don't worry. I know I'm 250% away from breaking even. But trust me, next year is going to be a monster, guys. You, you got to follow. I won't be that guy. So, uh, yeah, I'm just embarrassed of the financial industry constantly. Um, I'll pay. I got to calm down. I actually got a new Garmin watch here, this fancy little watch that i um, trying to really focus in on my running for the next four months, trying to do some low heart rate running. If I wore that watch during my Kathy Wood rant, I think I would have seen some alarms going off. I've set the alarms to, you know, heart rate zones. It would have been beeping all over the place, but uh, okay. Breathe, calm down. Here's a question. I already read this one, but I guess I'll read it again. Have you ever considered using the ZIVB in the tactical volatility strategy along with or replacing SVXY? I actually emailed you a full answer to this with a chart of comparing both SVXY and ZIVB in the performance. I suspect you haven't seen that email yet. So without boring too many people, no, the ZIV, unfortunately, as of right now, let me remember to do a screen share. We can go to, so even if I wanted to do this, we can go to the volatility shares website and we can see that this thing only has $1.4 million under management right now. It's untradeable. Our community, I'm not sitting here saying we're some massive, you know, high roller community, but our volume would absolutely dwarf this. Uh, we are way, probably 10 times at least that much. So, um, and that's just in 20% of our portfolio. I also have another, you know, company slash business, I suppose. Uh, it's called Prosperitas Asset Management, where I also license and I work with hedge funds and asset managers, financial advisors to, you know, implement my strategies within their clientele as well. So my signals don't only go to the VTS community. We've got, uh, you know, non-disclosure agreements and whatnot. I don't exactly know how much they invest with their capital, but some of them are very big outfits. And I couldn't even say how big our signals are with respect to that. So we would completely dwarf the ZIVB. It's not ready yet. But even if it was ready, there is reason to believe, and I've actually got a video coming out probably next week. I don't know if you can see this. This is coming from a different question that you had, but I actually prepared a little video for you and everybody else explaining this. But just for everybody's interest, the reason the ZIVB is interesting is because it uses the midterm futures, which don't move nearly as fast. So you can see here the old XIV, of course, cratered and crashed and burned. But the ZIV was only down about 14% or so on that day on Volpocalypse, February 5th, 2018. So there's certainly reason to believe that the ZIVB is a far better product than the VXX, the UVXY. Certainly that is true. The problem is for me as a tactical investor, I am quite good at risk management and I cycle out of risky positions long before something like that would end up happening, right? So the benefit to me to using the ZIVB within my tactical volatility strategy is actually significantly less. If it was buy and hold, absolutely the ZIVB is hands down way better than shorting the VXX or the UVXY because those products will at some point lose, you know, 70, 80, 90% of their capital. It's just a foregone conclusion. But the ZIVB probably won't, right? It's much lower moving midterm futures. But for me as a tactical investor, 45% of the time I'm in cash and then another 
five percent i'm in long vol so it just doesn't make it doesn't improve performance is the bottom line but check your email because i actually sent you something regarding that question and if i missed on my answer just go ahead and re-email me and i'll i'll try again okay in your experience sans the volatility barometer what are the two most effective timely and reliable robust dashboard indicators for trend following both individually and combined okay i like this question so i've probably answered it in several other places but if we go down to my volatility barometer from today's email of course this is the best volatility metric for trading right i've designed it to be a composition of about 14 other volatility metrics sort of ranked in priority of how good i think they are all percentile ranked checking the momentum over time and yes, if you have access to the VTS community and you have access to the barometer, you're going to get the best results following this. This is how I've gotten my good results. But the question is, without the barometer, which individual ones would you focus on? So number one, I would say, this is kind of cheating because there's several metrics in one, but just understanding the cash VIX term structure by itself there's a lot of useful information here. So if people aren't aware, the VIX index is a 30-day volatility, basically a statistic of S&P 500 expected movement going forward. But there are 9-day, 90-day, 3-month, 6-month, and 1-year measures that use the same, basically, formula and methodology, but they also form a term structure. Now remember that the VIX futures are a freely traded market, so, spoiler alert, the next one that I'm going to talk about is the roll yield, the VX30 to VIX roll yield. But the VIX futures are a freely traded market. So, anything can kind of happen there, and you, you can get really, really good metrics there. And this is actually how the VXX basically tracks its price. The methodology is the roll yield between the front two-month futures and the days to expiration to the VIX index. But... The VIX and all of these things are in relation to the S&P 500 options market. These are not tradable instruments. These are statistics that are based on S&P 500 options market. So it is a different place, right? So if combining these two, I would say number one is the VX30 to VIX roll yield, because like I said, VIX futures are how this thing is functioning. Number two, cash VIX oscillator, which is my creation of trying to put all of this into one single number. Now, of course, you can break it down and you could just look at the 3M crossover. This is probably the most meaningful if, you know, gun to my head, all of them. It's the VIX to the VIX 3M. But I designed a metric that basically tries to put everything into a single number. And that's the cash VIX oscillator. So I would say that. And then if you want to talk about a third best, the traders VRP would be my number three on this list. But yeah, you can find a lot of useful information outside the dashboard or the barometer. But the truth is that this basically combines everything that I can think of in the most robust way for trading, specific to trading. If it's above this level, you want to be in these four asset classes. If it's, if it's in this range, these are the asset classes that historically are by far the best. If it's way down here in the low range, then you got to cycle into these four asset classes. That's basically how it works. And it's it's a specific number, specific threshold that, you know, nothing is certain in the investing world, but the probabilistic nature of those thresholds is, is pretty high. It, statistically, we are most of the time on the right side of the trade. But uh, yeah, I would say number one, of course, VX30 to VIX roll yield. Number two, cash VIX oscillator. Number three, traders VRP. Okay, it's interesting. If you allocated five to six million in tactical volatility, how would you efficiently handle the entries and exits of SVXY and VXE, considering slippage and the constraints imposed by trade daily trading volume? Um, again, if you were talking about something like ZIVB, it would be the same answer. We probably couldn't do it. But if you're talking about the SVXY with roughly what I haven't looked in a while, but 300 million under management, and you got to remember too that volatility ETPs don't strictly follow the same rules that supply and demand stocks and ETFs do. The volatility market is based on methodologies of tracking underlying indexes, and they do have, you know, what's called authorized participants that are creating and removing shares to match the methodology to the underlying index. 
So volume does mean something a little different in the volatility space. Obviously, there's still bid ask spreads and all this stuff, but it's, I mean, I've never had an issue. I've, I've tracked these types of things and I've never had an issue. But like I said, with ZIVB, you're talking about a very low number. The VXZ, it's what, 50 million, something like that. When combined with the VIXM, I think that one's more, 70, 80 million. It's been a long time since I've looked at those numbers. But um, if you feel like it's gonna, if you feel like it's gonna be impacted, then maybe you could spread it out. You gotta remember too, that there's many ways to represent these and different people in the community do different things. So for example, my signal might say SVXY, but other people who maybe can't trade the SVXY or don't want to trade the SVXY, cause you know, difference between ETNs and ETFs and all that stuff. Some brokers don't allow it, some do, whatever it is. You can use one half the VXX, I suppose you could use one third of the UVXY in the options market. You can do 60 Delta options, VXX and UVXY that way. We've got Europeans in the community who unfortunately can't access American ETFs. So they do have to use stock replacement with options. So our volume isn't pushing those levels, but I would say it's, it's a non-issue for sure. ZIVB would not, it would make me a little bit nervous if I sent out a signal. Um, yeah, it'd make me a little nervous. Another thing I do want to, yeah, just thought of on the top of my head too, you have to understand that V the volume isn't consistent all the time. So the only times that we're ever buying the VXZ, the volume is going to be significantly higher at those times. You have to understand that we're only buying it during times of extreme crisis, massively elevated volatility levels. The volume ramps up substantially during those periods. And SVXY, same thing on the flip side. The only time we're ever in it is when it's stable and the, the market is conducive to short vol. Volume ramps up during those periods as well. So you might see an average volume level, but you know, depending on when you're typically holding it, for, uh, for me and VXZ and VIXM, it's never been an issue. And I don't think it ever will. Um, you know, if I suddenly started managing a billion dollars with my strategy, I don't know, would it matter? Maybe. But let's, let's attack that one when the day comes. Please explain how the iron condor backtesting, where to take historical data for option structures or the wheel of fun. Unfortunately, with this one, I kind of have to punt because nothing I've done for over a decade is really relying on backtesting. I haven't, I haven't really dove into backtesting in probably 15 years, to be honest. So everything that you see at VTS, 90% of it is live trading. Um, I, now I know, I don't dig into it because I have no use for it. So I'm not really the person to ask here. What you would probably do is Google, right? Everybody says, oh, I'll just Google it. But I seriously mean Google. There has got to be option backtesting tools out there that have a decent historical data record, right? I don't know them because I don't need them and I don't use them. But um, that's what I would suggest you do. Make a list of the top five, watch a couple YouTube videos on it, try a few of them. I mean, what's the harm in trying it? Let's say it costs you a hundred bucks for a monthly trial or something. Just give them a shot. See which one you like. Daniel, does your VTS tactical defensive and strategic tail risk ever take short positions? No, never. Um, but we do take negative positions, net negative. So where's the trade signals for the day? This one, is never going to go short the NASDAQ, but we will cycle out into the XLU, which is utilities, definitely performs better than stocks. So that's a safety position, except 2022, caveat, and cash, comfortable cash. This one hasn't really started yet. We made a few changes, so it's been in cash for a few weeks. But uh, gold in the middle range, mid to high range, performs much better than stocks. It's the only time I would ever hold gold, by the way, would never hold it over here. And then VXZ, of course, it is not a short, a direct short, because you can't short in an IRA, you can't short in a lot of these brokers. Uh, so it's just not feasible. But we do take long volatility positions in this one, VXZ. And we do take long volatility in the strategic tail risk when necessary, VIXM. Again, midterm futures. I love the slow nature of midterm futures. Now, technically, you could replace this with one half VXX, and you could replace this with the same or one third UVXY if you wanted, doesn't really matter. 
But no, we don't ever directly short anything. Even both were in cash on our options right now. Market seems a little bit running on fumes. But even both of our volatility strategies, iron condors and butterflies on VXX, they don't short either. Those are defined risk options. So my entire portfolio, 100% of it, is tradable within an IRA. And that's designed for a reason because a lot of investors need that, right? I don't, I live in Dubai. I'm kind of outside of that, you know, the, the need for doing that. But uh, most people do actually need, uh, need their strat near portfolio to be IRA friendly. And VTS is 100% IRA friendly. All right, where are we at? Path dependency characterizes levered ETPs. There are two outcomes that lead to losses, price decrease or sideways movement. The only path to gains is price going up. Exactly. That's a very good... Um, my presentation was 20 minutes. Yours was 30 seconds, but um, you basically said the same thing. Yeah, you, you need a system to avoid those drawdowns. Otherwise, it's going to be more harm than good. That's just the bottom line. If, if, if you can't avoid at least half the drawdown, don't do it. And a lot of people, again, I stressed it before, but I'll stress it again. A lot of people think they can. They have an idea that they can. They've even been told by somebody on Twitter that, oh, it's fine. You just reserve some capital and you just defend it when you need to. It doesn't work that way. In a crisis, things move so fast, you can't hedge during the crisis. You have to have them on beforehand. And of course, you can't reserve the cat capital on the sidelines because that means that the trades that are winning are making pennies, right? I've actually heard people say this when you're shorting volatility, like shorting naked calls on UVXY, just reserve four times your capital on the sidelines and then sell your UVXY calls. Well, the first thing is UVXY actually can go through 10 layers, not just four. So you'd have to reserve at least 10 times your capital on the sideline. But the second thing is, okay, you've reserved 80% of your money on the sidelines to defend it in a crisis. Well, that means you've got 20% of your capital working for you, which means every time you do get an easy win, it's nothing. A short call based on the margin that it costs is already pennies on the dollar. It's a super inefficient trade. You can only ever make the premium you collect. You get 40 cents for a call, and if you win, you get 40 cents. VXX goes down $5, you get 40 cents. Great, good, good trade. And it costs, what, $1,200 per contract in reserve capital? It's insane that people actually do this. But the second thing is, every time you do get tiny pennies on the dollar for a winning trade, it's also pennies on the dollar of your portfolio size because you reserved 80% of your capital to defend it in a crisis. Why wouldn't you just take an efficient option structure from the very beginning, like a butterfly, you can deploy 10 times the amount of capital to each trade with no upside risk. It, it just blows my mind that people on Twitter actually talk about this nonsense. But yeah, um, where was I? I totally lost my train of thought there. Yeah, um, essentially it, it comes down to managing those drawdowns and you, you, can't, you can't wait for it to happen and then try to, okay, now I'm gonna manage the risk. Too late, it's already gone way past you. And you got to remember too, this is not specific to your question. This is a short ball thing, but there's layers where this thing starts to go against you. Not only does your trade start going badly, and then you have to deploy all these layers, but your capital in your account is going down because you're losing money, which means your buying power is going down, which means every layer that you add on top of it has to be exponentially higher. We call that martingaling. And you can just Google what martingaling leads to it leads to bankruptcy. But then also the brokers can increase margin requirements and they almost always do in a crisis. So you're gonna get hit with that as well. It's just gonna be this like layer upon layer. And you're gonna realize after the fact, wow, this guy on Twitter told me all I had to do was reserve four times my capital. Well, here we are, we had nine winning trades in a row and I feel like I didn't make much money. And then I had one big losing trade and boom, the whole thing cascaded downwards. Well. Do they have to give back their followers when this happens to you? No. They still get to keep all the benefits of lying to you all these years, but they don't have to give it back when it blows up in your face. So be very careful who you follow. The Kathy Woods of the world, they're slick talkers. There are people on Twitter in the short ball space, they really know what to say. They're slick talkers. But when the time comes and the crisis happens, you're out a lot of money and they just pretend it didn't happen. That's what's going to happen. Mark my words, that day is coming. 
They're just going to be like, what? Draw it? What? Crisis? I, I didn't say that. Oh, you. And then you're going to be on Twitter saying, well, you told me that. Oh, I didn't say that. What are you talking about? I don't remember that. All the tweets are deleted. So what are you going to do? Another rant. I should put this thing on and check my heart rate today. Going crazy. All right. What will draw down and Kegger for your strategy when you replace? Okay, you asked that surely before I did my presentation. But just for your sake, here is the two times QLD, talking about 35 return, 49. The average of the three largest drawdowns being 30. So it's still, still totally manageable. Like drawdowns are lower than the rate of return. So my performance score is still very positive. But three times... It, trust me, it's a non-starter. It might look good. Oh, wow, I can make 45%. Yeah, you can, but you can't sustain a 67% drawdown. Trust me. You might think you can, but you can't. I'll tell you, I have had people, given my performance over the last 12 years, I still get people saying it's too rocky a ride, which is insane because, again, not to be too self-serving here on a live stream, but I challenge anybody to find somebody who managed risk better than I did. And I still get people who leave because the drawdowns are too big. 2022, we were down 25% at one point at the low. Okay, but you know, we've made 23% return for 12 years as well. So, you know, managing risk is one of those things where people just look at A to Z. They look at where it started, where it is now, and they kind of gloss over that middle part and they think, oh, 67% drawdown. Hmm. But I do like that 45% return. Maybe I'll just go ahead and do it. And I'll just do this and close my eyes. No, you won't. When it happens in the moment, you're going to pull the plug. I guarantee it. So TQQQ, TQQQ. No, absolutely no. Under any circumstances, no. If it's Kathy Wood style level of just brutal risk management, not even the one times cues is going to help that. But for me, I'm not good enough to manage the triple leveraged. It's and look, not to be rude, you're not either. So just don't do it. Do you play stock pair trading with options? I like this question. I can uh, do another self-serving plug here in a second. If so, maybe you could point some advice about option strategy in the best way. Okay. Uh, yes, we used to have a community called VTS Options, but it's got, it's got to be a year and a half now. I had to shut that down. I am a one-man show here, and I just got way too overwhelmed with emails. I already spend five, six hours a day answering emails, so I just got overwhelmed. I had to shut one of them down. I shut VTS Options down. But it will be coming back because I've streamlined some systems and I have somebody who's really helped me out a lot, who's you know automated the website and automated the payments. And I'm getting much better at answering emails and pointing people to the right direction. So I will be able to relaunch VTS options quite soon. Um, you know, again, I like to just say things honestly and then don't hold it against me if it has to be pushed back. But I am targeting January 1st as a, a good start for a relaunch of our options community. And uh, spoiler alert, there is a strategy in that. Probably won't be launched right away because I have to build an entire course for each strategy. So it's going to be in stages. But yeah, it's called pairs trading. You know, spoiler alert. I like pairs trading. You just have to be very careful. Uh, pairs trading really comes down to timing. There's a lot of path dependency on when you jump in and when you jump out. Um, so there's a lot that people need to know. But yes, to answer your question, there are opportunities there to let's say you double short two triple leverage products or you've got a s individual stock like Apple and you think it's going to be awesome, right? So you could maybe go long Apple in a long trade and then you could short the NASDAQ. And that would be, you know, if you're wrong, you don't get your face ripped off. If you're right, you get the Apple outperformance of the NASDAQ. That would be an example. Another thing you could do if you just want to do a pure volatility play and nothing else Again, same thing. You could do a long straddle, for example. Let's say you had a long vol bias. You think right now volatility in the market's very low. I think it's going to go up. I want to do a pure Vega play. Well, you could do something similar. You could do a long straddle on Apple, which is a long Vega trade. And then you could do a short Vega trade for a longer distance on something else. And you're basically playing the difference between the Vega changes. There's all kinds of ways that you can pair two things against each other. Um, it could be very simplistic things like Coke versus Pepsi. I mean, if you feel like you've got a timing system, great, do that. If you could do, you know, what's in and out of favor, you know, Microsoft versus Google. I, I don't know. There's all kinds of things. Mine typically are, you know, trapping that Vega and capturing that. Or like I said, 
option trades on you think one's going to be better than the than the index or one's going to be worse like short something that you think is the you know biggest pile of steaming dog shit in the index and then go long the index and then you can kind of pair those against each other lots of fun stuff when you talk about pairs trading so vts options will return and among the sort of eventual courses that'll cover 10 different strategies pairs trading will be a fun one for sure Love the rant. My thoughts exactly. Good. Some support. Hopefully people don't think, oh, this guy's just a hater. I'm not a hater. You can't incinerate $20 billion and then not get made fun of for it. Jim Cramer can't be ringing his bells calling this woman the greatest investor of all time and not get made fun of for it. This is just ignorance at its finest. So I'm going to go ahead and do it my way. And uh, I thought I was pretty polite. I think I did Canadian version. If you want to see my off the record version, it would be, um, I wouldn't be able to post it on YouTube. Trust me. The guys from Prosperity Fund ran all your strategies are only ETF. Well, Prosperitas is my company. So they're not from the Prosperitas Fund. That's me. I'm Prosperitas Asset Management. And so I would work with a company. I can't give names or anything like that. Some of them you've probably heard of, but um, essentially what we do is, technically speaking, if you were a financial advisor, for example, and I have tons of financial advisors who follow my signals, by the way, and I don't ask any questions. I don't ask any details. I can't. I'm unregistered. I have all the certifications in Canada. I have many levels to be a portfolio manager. Could do that right away. But I just, you know, I like my global lifestyle and whatnot. I've covered that. But technically speaking, if you're an asset manager and you have clients, you could just subscribe for $89 a month and then use my signals with your client's money. But the problem is, first of all, there would have to be disclosures there. If there's not, that would be illegal. You can't get third-party signals and go invest your client money in that. If something goes wrong and you get sued, it's going to be a big problem. So what I do is I actually work directly with people and we enter an actual official licensing agreement so that everybody knows what's going on and they know that, okay, we're, we're working with this consultant and it is based on a consultant style uh, relationship. And then look, if they think that my signals are going to help them, maybe they can put 10%, 20% of their client capital through my strategies. It's all up and up. The clients know what, what's going on. There's been disclosures and it's all good. So technically speaking, you could bypass Prosperitas by just lying and Surely there's plenty of people in the asset management world that have no problem doing that. If I look at the emails of all the people that sign up for my service, uh, a lot of them are like, you know, very hedge fundy sounding emails, but I don't ask any questions. I just have a method. If people want to enter an actual consulting agreement, there's a way to do that. So I didn't mean to give you the idea that um, I'm giving something away or anything, but yes, they... They are free to use the strategies any way they see fit. So there are other outfits out there following VTS signals as well. Might, I, I don't know, might be a dollar, might be a hundred million. I have no idea. I don't ask. I just uh, help them out. I, sometimes I prepare stuff to do presentations for their clients and whatnot, make sure everybody understands what's going on. But um, yeah, that's what it is. Prosperitas. Just a nothing little side thing. I never even mention it. I probably mentioned it twice in the last 10 years. It's, it's not, I don't market it or anything like that. It's just sometimes people ask and then I uh, go ahead and get into it. There are two streams where you take historical options pricing for backtesting strategy like Iron Condor. You know, I don't know. Are you asking about the actual think back in think or swim? This is, this is going to be manual old school. This is what I used to do. I used to just get, you know, back then I was kind of a fatty, to be honest. And I used to drink the Frappuccino, the caramel Frappuccinos from Starbucks. It's back in like 2007, 2008. I used to stay in Starbucks all day long, literally all day long. Did I screen share? And I'd drink two or three of those Frappuccinos doing back testing. So if you think that, like this is called Think Back from... Ameritrade, if I wanted to know what happened with an iron condor, let's say, you know, spy iron condor here, well, what would have happened if I opened one here on June 15th, 2023? You can just go here and do June 15th, 2023. It pulls up all the data. You know me and the 
you know, we like to do 45 to 75 days to expiration. So you can go ahead and just do this and you can, oh, that's interesting. It's showing all those values. That's ugly. It's probably going to get in the way when I show you this, but you know, when you can go through this and 15 Delta options, I don't even have this set up. You can see, like, I don't, I don't use this very often. So let's go ahead and get the Delta, um, short something around the 412. You could go long something around the 466. So what would have happened on a 410, 405? Bear with me. And I said 466, let's just push it to 470. Let's get a real wide wing iron condor going here. If this is what you're talking about, sure, grab a coffee and go ahead and do this. That would have been a profitable trade. Adjust the contracts, whatever you want. You can do this. I kind of thought you were talking about more the AI programming new school method. This is back in 2006. I used to do that stuff. Just spreadsheets that would crash my computer. I used to do testing for 10 hours a day for five years straight, right? Um, I, it's been a decade since I've done that. So these days, I'm sure you can just program something in. What would happen if you did this, this, and that, all these conditions, hit the button and it'll spit it out for you. I just have no need for back testing because everything I do is live trading these days. So, um, but if that's what you mean, then yeah, think back will get you there. If you wanted to just target 10 or 20 trades, it's not going to take you more than an hour to do that. If you wanted to do a full back test, I mean, 10 hours, you can get a really good idea using just think back and think or swim. You don't have 10 hours to make more money. I think people probably do. Most people won't do it, but um, boy, I spent, you know how they say, you know, the outliers book, 10,000 hours makes you an expert. I've probably spent 60, 70,000 hours on my investing. So I have no problem just rolling up my sleeves and doing 12 hours of work. I, I can do it easily. So there you go. Yeah, you can you can build you can at least go back three, four years and get a very good idea. You don't have to go back 10 years, but think back's decent. Yeah. Do you play stock? Already answered that. Am I done? Can't wait for VTS options. Yep, I'm gonna do my best to make it really much better than before. Before we had a good 600 people in that in that um, service. And I'm planning to do it much better next time around with uh, full courses for each strategy. It's, it's going to be good stuff. So you know what? I'm surprised. I was ready to keep going, but I am done. An hour 17 in, I got through every question. So I'll take about 30 seconds, calm my heart rate down after my epic rants here today. If there's any last minute questions, I'll do it. Yeah, I'm really getting in. So what I've discovered, I've been a runner for about 25 years. I run, you know, the equivalent of about four marathons a month, just in mileage. And I've never paid any attention to it. I'm not serious. I don't track anything. I don't really care. I just like going out running. I get so much of my work done. I'm thinking about my strategies and my, you know, my trading and all, all the things, even YouTube stuff. I'll, I'll, basically write half a script of a YouTube video while I'm out there on the road in, you know, 16, 18 kilometer run. Unfortunately, here in Dubai, 45 degree plus weather. But um, I never really got into it. Now, recently, I've been watching a lot of podcasts. And they say that the key to improvement is zone two running, where you have to keep your heart rate basically in your zone two. And my heart rate is... Um, you know, I've been an athlete my whole life. So it's my resting heart rate's like 46. My max heart rate's almost 200. My variability is really, really good. So unfortunately, my zone two is about 130 beats per minute heart rate. If I want to stay at zone two running, 130, I can, I can go to 160 and pin that for three hours. To get to 130, I did it for the first time on my new Garmin watch uh, yesterday felt like I was walking. This is just going to be embarrassingly slow. But yeah, to try to get my heart rate down to 130 is for, you know, an hour and a half running at 130. It's impossible in 45 degree weather. But uh, boy, it's, it's going to be hard even when I go back to other countries in the winter. So that's my next sort of personal challenge. Um, if anybody's interested, you know, just a little peek into my own life. 
I probably work like 10, 12 hours a day, seven days a week. So, I mean, I don't have much of a life. This, what you're seeing right now, this is pretty much what I do. And I'm gonna just gonna answer a couple hours of emails before bed and then go to bed. I will check my VXX trade, see, um, see if we're gonna actually get assigned. But most of my life is just this. This is, I mean, you're watching me right now, 23, 24. Um, so my hobbies, I'll watch the UFC this weekend because it's, it's a good card. We got Dustin Poirier against Justin Gaethje, BMF belt. We've got uh, Alex Pereira versus uh, Jan Blahovich. It's going to be an amazing fight. And then, of course, boxing fans, come on. Spence Crawford this weekend, come on. We've been waiting for that for years. I just hope, you know, I'm a Crawford fan, so... He, he's a little older. He, it's, it's not what I would call his prime, but I think he's probably still up for it. And so my hobbies, I guess my original point, was basically running, weightlifting, watching UFC. That's pretty much it. So I think it's time. Golfing. I shouldn't forget golfing. I did start golfing again. For about 16, 17 years, I didn't golf at all. Just got into it recently. But yeah, I'm going to try. So you might see a few posts on me from me on Twitter talking about my heart rate. Don't get me started on all these losers in the financial industry because that'll push my heart rate and then my watch will start ringing the alarm bells. All right, no more questions. We did it. Decent timing. Thank you everybody for showing up. Give the video a like on your way out the door. There was way more viewers today than likes, so that's not a good sign. And um, we'll be back next Friday for sure. We have to continue that VXX trade. I want to show you. I am actually curious to see how low we can go with that thing. I think it'd be cool if I'm still making money and still selling covered calls at like 20 and 19. That, that'd be awesome. Plus, that would mean, of course, the VTS portfolio is crushing it. So uh, that'll be fun too. So come back next week, next Friday, and we will do it again. Prepare all your questions. See you next week.